to Vicky Pope. Um, I'm very pleased to uh, welcome Vicky this evening. Um, I know that uh, um, uh, we did try and get her to talk in, in December and sadly she was unable to do so. I'm very pleased that she's, she's come back to us again. Um, the, uh, for those of you who don't know um, Vicky, um, and I certainly don't, um, Vicky used to work uh, for many years as, at the UK Met Office. Um, she fulfilled various roles there as a, as a climate science researcher, a program manager, um, as a communicator of publicly important science and, and a partnership developer. Um, and she's now moved on to building up a portfolio career, focusing on the issues that she really cares about and where she feels she can make a tangible dis difference. And I know the, the thing that she's doing at the moment that's particularly, um, uh, she's particularly keen on is, is editing the uh, Climate Resilience and Sustainability Sustainability Journal, which is a journal, an academic journal, which deals with adaptation to climate change and its impact on, um, on, on, on us. Um, she's got a particular interest in climate modelling um, and indeed uh, has very kindly directed us towards the Royal Institution website where there is a talk that she's given on climate modelling, which is readily discoverable. Um, and perhaps we'll, we'll uh, send the uh, details of that out in a, in a follow up newsletter as well. Um, Vicky's uh, topic tonight is about the science of climate change and, and its effect on wildlife. So it's with great pleasure I hand you over to Vicky and uh, um, we very much uh, look forward to your talk. Thank you, Simon. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Just We did test this earlier, so hopefully it'll work. But... So you should be able to see my first slide, which is the introductory slide. That's good. Um, so um, it, it was quite good preparing for this talk, actually, because I give lots of talks on climate change and I tend to roll out the same slides every time and uh, I had to get some new material for this. So I learned a few things along the way uh, it, um, and it will be good to get your feedback as well, because I, there may be some people in the audience who know more about impacts on, on wildlife, particularly. Um, obviously, my expertise is primarily around climate modelling. Um, but one of the things I found over the years is that um, it's increasingly important that the climate science feeds into understanding how that science impacts on on other things and so that was really why i was keen to set up this new um, journal which simon mentioned earlier um, and um, of course one of those major impacts is wildlife and so you know this is a really important topic i think so um it's worth reflecting first of all on what climate is um, because uh, it sometimes causes some confusion and uh, sometimes climate change skeptics use that confusion as a means of kind of sowing doubt in in the um what climate models are telling us about the future um so you know whether whether is that is, is what we experience from day to day the climate is really about the average of the weather not just you know the and the um, annual mean weather or the even the decadal mean uh, weather but actually that that those averages but also the variability so how often you get winter storms how often you get summer heat waves you know how often is it dry in april like it is now you know all of those sorts of things that is all about climate and what we're what what we hope what we hope to do with climate models is to understand how um the, that climate will change in the future so will we get you know more episodes of flooding um is the particular flood that we've seen a, a caused by climate change well we can never say that because we can um you know we always what we can do is say that the probability of that event has increased and so um and and also look at whether that particular event might have happened if we hadn't had climate change and if it, we had had climate change and look at the probabilities so there are ways of giving an indication as to how much climate change is contributing to the changes that we see and I'm going to talk a little bit about the science that underpins those models that we use to do the predictions. I'm not really going to say much, anything much about the models themselves, um, because I want to focus more on the impacts uh, of, of climate change and particularly the impact on wildlife. But I will start um, just by saying a little bit about the, the basic science of what drives the weather and climate. So hopefully some of you will have learned some of this when you were at school or maybe if you did geography at university or whatever. Um, but um, this is really about how the climate system works. And there are very, you can think of it in terms of various different cycles. There's the energy cycle, which you know, ultimately the energy that pumps the whole thing comes from the sun. Um, and then there's the water cycle, the general circulation. And 
um, the change that we're inducing, which, which is changing that balance. So all of these things are in balance. And it's as you, as you change things that influence those that we, we're changing that balance. So if we think about the energy cycle first, so we've got ultraviolet radiation coming from the sun. So that's obviously there's a lot of heat coming from the sun. And some of that's reflected by clouds. Some of it which is, is reflected by the earth and some of it's absorbed by the atmosphere. Uh, and, it's, and these things are fairly obvious if you think about it. If it's a cloudy day, it tends to be cooler uh, you know, when, uh, when you're outside. If it's a sunny day, it tends to be hotter. And that's just reflecting that some of that um, sun's energy is being reflected by the clouds. So um, that um, energy heats up the atmosphere, it heats up the surface. The surface of the earth becomes warmer and therefore it, it also radiates heat back out, um, but, it, but it's at a, a much longer wavelength. So it's, it's um, uh, infrared radiation, which, um, and uh, that, some of that heat energy passes through the atmosphere and some of it um, gets um, absorbed by the clouds, some of it gets re-emitted back towards the surface. It's quite a complex array of processes. But basically, the, that those processes will balance out until uh, they'll, they'll adjust themselves until the whole thing is balanced. Because if there was more energy coming in than going out, then the Earth would heat up, it would, more energy would go out again, and it would eventually come into balance. So um, that's uh, that, that anything that we do to change the composition of the atmosphere that will change the radiative balance won't change that balance at the top of the atmosphere. It changes what's happening within the atmosphere. Um, so um, what happens with um, when you increase the amount of uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is it acts like um, uh, a blanket, like a bit like a duvet, really. So the greenhouse gases, um, there are a number of greenhouse gases that are important. Water vapour is actually the most important greenhouse gas. Um, and then carbon dioxide is probably the second most important. And then there are other things like methane. But it's the changes in carbon dioxide that are really important. But I'll come back to that in a minute. So the greenhouse gases basically trap the heat. So um, these, this, um, hopefully you can see my arrow moving around, but these arrows going up and down. So that's where heat's being absorbed and then re-emitted. And uh, that, that's um, keeping the surface of the atmosphere warm. So without those greenhouse gases, the surface of the earth would be at 15 degrees centigrade. Uh, sorry, with, so without them, it would be at minus 18 degrees centigrade, where it's actually at 15 degrees centigrade. So greenhouse gases mean that, we, that the Earth is habitable. Without them, it would not be habitable. So they are very important. What's what, what the difficulty is if you change that balance. So if you you know you decrease the amount of greenhouse gas, the temperature will go down. If you increase it, it will go up. And what we're doing now is we're releasing um, a lot of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, like carbon dioxide and methane and others. And that's tending to warm the atmosphere. It's changing the balance. And what it's actually doing is warming up the surface and cooling down the upper atmosphere. So this, the, at the top of the atmosphere, you've still got the same balance. But it, internally within the atmosphere, it's warmer at the surface because the heat's being trapped and it's cooler higher up. And you can see that pattern. And it's one of the things that gives us confidence in, the, in our understanding of the climate, that we can see that pattern of change, that it's, it's, um, it's consistent with what we understand from the physics. So um, that's that's the kind of basic process. If we then go on to the um, the water cycle, so I mentioned that water is is also water vapor is also a greenhouse gas, but the water vapor is responding in this situation. So that we, we're changing the forcing by putting the amount of uh, the changing the amount of carbon dioxide and methane and other gases. And what happens then is as it warms, as the surface warms up, there's more evaporation of moisture from the surface, um, more transport of water vapour, more formation of clouds, overall more rainfall, although in some places there will be less rainfall. So you tend to get more flooding and more drought, um, but overall more rainfall. And that water vapour, as it increases, also actually acts as a greenhouse gas. So in fact, it has a multiplying effect. So for every degree of warming from um, carbon dioxide, you get another degree of warming from the water vapour feedback. Um, unfortunately, we can't force the water vapour to do something different to counteract that. It, 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 it does respond in that way. Um, one of the reasons, those of you that know about radiation, um, one of the reasons that um, carbon dioxide has such a big effect is that the water vapour, a, a lot of the wavelengths that water vapour um, absorbs that are already saturated because there's so much water vapour in the atmosphere. But the carbon dioxide absorbs at a different wavelength. So it's in what we call the water vapour window. And so even though the amount of carbon dioxide is, is relatively small, it has a relatively big effect. 
So um, the, the kind of detailed physics is quite important in that, in this process, um, in understanding what's happening. So the other thing that happens to redistribute heat is the general circulation. So um, obviously it's cold at the pole and warm at the equator. So you're going to tend to get uh, winds and ocean currents that tend to redistribute that heat between the equator and the pole. And, and that's what gives rise to the weather that we have. And of course, because the Earth is spinning, it doesn't just go from the equator to the pole, it actually goes round as well because of the Coriolis effect. So you get these complex weather patterns and different types of weather patterns in different parts of the globe, basically because of the geometry of the, of the globe and the fact that the Earth is spinning. So all of that acts to um, uh, redistribute the heat. So you can imagine that as we start to change that balance and change the way that we're the, the atmosphere is, is heating in different parts of the uh, different uh, different layers in the atmosphere and also different parts of the world that the that general circulation is going to change as well and so our weather patterns will change as well so that's what gives rise to some of the um the difficulties in modeling how climate will change in the future is that is understanding how that circulation will change so um that's just saying that it rebalances the heat so this is just really summarizing what i said about some of the things that um uh, change the way that the, the balance works. So obviously we're burning a lot of fossil fuels. There's a lot of changes in land use, um, uh, things like forest fires, which might be made worse if, if certain areas become drier, for example. Um, all of these things have an impact on the greenhouse gases. Um, I should say that one uh, a lot of the other things that we have to look at is general air pollution. So um, things like the pollution that you get from diesel cars, for example, um, the, um, nox, uh, the nitrogen oxides uh, in particular, and but also you get parti particulates, so kind of particles of soot, other types of particles. They affect the way that the, the clouds operate, for example, they affect that radiative balance. So in net, the net effect of those is actually to cool the climate. So paradoxically, the, the kind of pollutants that cause problems with, um, you know, for people in terms of air, air quality and so on, actually cool the climate and, and slow down that warming. But obviously, the, uh, the, the urgent thing to, to, to reduce those um, pollutants means that we actually are accelerating the warming. That's not to say we shouldn't do it, we clearly should do it, because air pollution is a very real um, and a very immediate problem. Um, but it does mean we have to redouble our efforts to reduce other, the greenhouse gases. So moving on now to some of the evidence of climate change. So this is shows a diagram of the carbon dioxide concentration going back 800,000 years. And this is using um, ice, uh, tr uh, preserved air bubbles um, trapped in the Antarctic ice because they, they were trapped hundreds of thousands of years ago and you're able to measure the amount of CO2 in them. And so you can see the cycle. And... Um, I should say that my husband encouraged me to add that uh, star on the on the diagram because he thought that that vertical line was the was the axis. So this vertical line here at the edge of the graph that that was actually the axis. Well, it's not. It's actually the change in carbon dioxide since the industrial revolution. So we're already seeing a massive change compared to what we've seen over the last eight hundred thousand years, and obviously it's continuing to increase. Um, so it just gives you an idea of the scale of change that we're talking about as compared to um, you know, historical and prehistoric times. So just looking at some of the direct measures, so that, those are indirect measurements, we're measuring them from ice cores. These, these are the measurements from the Mauna Mo Loa obs Observatory um, in the Pacific. And these have, were started in the 1950s. Um, and you can see the, the increase, um, pretty much constant increase over time um, in that uh, record with obviously a seasonal variation because the the way that um, I should I should have said before carbon dioxide as well as being a greenhouse gas it's obviously also very important for um, for life on the planet and uh, it's it cycles through the biosphere basically and uh, because there's more land mass in the northern hemisphere um, that tends to have more impact than the southern hemisphere and so you see a cycle as as we cycle from um, uh, the, the summer in the northern hemisphere to the summer in the southern hemisphere. So um, this illustrates the importance of measurements. One of the difficulties of doing climate measurements is that you know when you when you're applying for funding, you get your funding for five years, and then people, the funders want to pay for something that's more exciting and new. But for climate measurements, you need continuity. And in fact, these measurements, which are really important for um, the, the longest 
a direct uh, record of CO2. Um, they continually um, had to struggle to get the funding for it. But uh, I think it, it because in the early days, they didn't really, a lot of people didn't appreciate the importance of it. Um, so it's, uh, it is one of the difficulties. And I know in the kind of wildlife space, this is always an issue is to making sure we have the right measurements so we understand how things are changing and can you know, make judgments on the basis of that. This is a record of the temperature going back to 1850. And the gray shading on this represents the uncertainty in the measurements. So there's a number of reasons for uncertainty. One is if you look in the 1800s, there's fewer measurements than there are now. The, the instruments they used were less accurate. So we can be less sure of exactly what the global average temperature was in 1850 than we are now. But nevertheless, even taking into account that uncertainty, you can see that there's a very definite increase. And that increase is consistent with what we would expect because we've been increasing greenhouse gases. So um, that, I, this um, diagram was produced by the Met Office, actually. And I think they're, I don't know where they still are, but they certainly were one of the only groups that really actually quantified that uncertainty. Um, others just produced a line, basically, so you couldn't really see that difference. Um, and then the other thing that um, carbon dioxide does is it gets absorbed into the um, ocean. I, I mentioned that um, the, so one, uh, I'll come on to this in a minute, but one of the reasons that, um, one of the things that moderates the, the warming for um, increasing uh, greenhouse gases is that some of them are absorbed, uh, not, not just into soils, but also into the ocean. And that uh, slows down the warming, but it also causes damage to um, wildlife in the ocean. Um, and obviously, uh, coral reefs are a, 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 a clear example of that. So what about the changes that we're already seeing? So um, this is really looking at extremes of weather and other types of extremes and looking at how they've changed since the 1980s and whether we can link those changes to um, climate change or whether they're just random changes. So you can see with these um, graphs that the um, there's along the bottom, we've got this red, these red bars, which are geophysical events. So there's earthquakes, tsunamis and volcanic activity. Obviously, they're not at all affected by um, uh, climate change. So we'd expect those to be pretty constant. And in fact, they are. There's variations from year to year, but there's no trend. When we look at meteorological events like tropical storms, uh, extratropical storms, um, um, you see you see some increase. When we look at flood flood events and mass movements of water, we see massive increases here. And so it, it does look as though the, the changes that we're seeing there are consistent with what we would expect from the, the changing climate. The um, that, and, and similarly for wild wild. Um, extremes of temperature and droughts and wildfire. Now, that, that, that's not quite as clear, um, but as you go to the later period, there are there is an increase, um, but the, 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 the flooding is, is, is clearer and consistent with the fact that overall, the amount of water in the atmosphere is increasing. So using models, they can, you can actually look at how likely these events are to occur. So what, what they do in this case is they, they run a model in, in a, the real you know, as much as they can like the real world and then a hypothetical world assuming there were no green no uh, increase no industrial revolution basically no increase in greenhouse gases and doing that you can look at how many extreme events there are in those two model worlds and you what you can say from that is more than 60 percent of the extreme events studied to date were made more likely or more severe by man-made climate change so that's a pretty um no, that's a pretty bold statement, and uh, it's it's because it is really with extreme events where you see the impacts of climate change first. Um, if you think about a global average temperature change of one degree, what on earth does that mean in terms of the day-to-day -day temperature? I mean, it varies much more than that from one day to the next. It's only in that manifestation in terms of how the weather changes that you, you're seeing it, and uh, changes in seasonality as well, and things like that, which obviously have a big impact on things like wildlife. So uh, I mentioned about carbon dioxide um, being absorbed into the ocean and into the um, biosphere, basically, that, you know, land mass um, and in, well, in, into um, soils, into plants and so on. And what, so what you see here is that the emissions from 1960 um, have been increasing steadily. The CO2 growth in the atmosphere varies from year to year, um, but, it's, but it's also increasing, but at a much slower rate. If we look at these peaks in the CO2, these coincide to warm years. So um, 
when it's warm, not as much CO2 gets absorbed into the, in, in, into the biosphere. More of it ends up in the atmosphere. So you can see that very clearly in these events. These, these warm years were um, El Nino events that, that's a thing, that's something that happens in the Pacific. And it um, uh, causes, well, it causes big changes in the weather, but overall it gives you a, a slight increase in the temperature globally. Um, so what this means is that, uh, is that as the temperature warms, we're going to get another feedback, not just the water vapor feedback, but the, um, the, the carbon cycle feedback. As, as it warms up, less of that CO2 that we're emitting will stay in the, will, will be absorbed into the biosphere. More of it will end up in the atmosphere. And so again, we get an accelerating, it's what we call a positive feedback. So we've got the positive water vapor feedback and we've got a positive carbon cycle feedback. There are some negative feedbacks as well, but these positive feedbacks are obviously acceler will accelerate the warming. As, as it gets warmer, it will start to speed up, speed up more. So, um, I mentioned about doing model runs with um, without global warming, uh, with and without the greenhouse gases, the additional greenhouse gases, I should say, in there. And this is a, a model example of what, what happens when you do that. So if you look at the top one, um, you've got the black line is the observations. Um, in fact, there's a couple of black lines there. And then the red and the blue lines are the models. Um, they're, the, they're the kind of average models taken from all of these yellow models and grey models, which come from a whole range of experiments that people have done in different, in different modelling centres around the world. And these are with natural forcing. So this is without any increase in greenhouse gases. And what you can see is you can't explain the warming in the, in the latter part of the 20th century. Um, it's more consistent earlier on. When you look at the, if you add in the, the human forcing, so the increase in carbon dioxide and other gases, then you do mirror what happens in the atmosphere. So this is the type of thing that we look at to give the evidence that the climate, the changing, the, the changes that we're seeing in the climate are actually due to um, increased greenhouse gases, uh, or at least a large part of it um, is very likely to be due to that. Now, the other thing that you can do is look at the patterns of change. And um, because what you see is that um, the, some of the, the, the different forcings have, a, have different patterns. So the natural forcings here is this, this diagram at the top, which basically shows not very much happening. There's not much change. And then the natural and human forcing, you've got a lot of warming in the, in the Arctic, less warming in the tropics, less warming over the sea because the sea absorbs a lot, the ocean absorbs a lot of heat, so it warms up more slowly at the surface. And then looking at the observed trend, it looks very similar. Not the same, but there are differences. The models are not perfect. Um, but we can e equally, we can look at these kind of signatures and that gives us more confidence again that the patterns are, are right um, in, in, in the changes that we see. So I just wanted to uh, give another example of how the temperature, um, to put it into context really, so if we look at the right hand side of this diagram, we can see the historical um, changes in temperature. This, is, this was 2005. You can see the increase that we're expecting up to 2100. The red shaded area is the, is the high emission scenario models. It's, it's looking at a range of models. And then these other ones are lower emissions if we manage to reduce our emissions. But as you get out to 2200, you're getting up much higher and so on if we, if, if, um, we continue to emit at these rates. If you look at the, the prehistoric period, so these are all um, using um, various different measures of uh, temperature, um, using ice cores and so on, going right the way back 60 million years, you can see that by 2100, we will re be reaching a temperature that we haven't seen and so, since uh, 5 million years ago. So it's, it's, it, wasn't, wasn't, it hasn't been as warm as that um, for 5 million years. And if we go to 2200, you're going back even further, 40 million years. This scale is not linear, by the way. So it goes back in tens of thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years, and then millions and tens of millions. So it just gives you an idea of the scale of the change that we're talking about. Now, if you go back to those periods, actually the sea level was you know, tens of meters higher than it is now. You won't expect a massive change in sea level by 2100 because the, um, the ocean takes a while to warm up and also the, um, the ice takes a long time to melt. So it's land ice melting and the ocean heating up and expanding that gives rise to sea level rise. And that will take a long time, luckily for us. But nevertheless, it's a commitment. We are committing to that if we increase the warming to those levels. 
So moving on now to um, some of the risks from climate change. So there's a lot of work being done to look at what some of the different impacts are. And this is just a summary of some of the things that are important, I suppose, for the, the human population at, um, at two degrees and at four degrees. So it's trying to compare the, t the you know, temperatures but before the Industrial Revolution and then two degrees higher and then four degrees higher. What impact will that have on water stress? And that's saying water stress actually, you know, it's 1.5 billion people will ha have difficulty with access to water at two degrees, but two billion at four degrees. And of course, there is some element there, I think, mixed into that calculation will be water stress caused by you know, population growth and things like that as well, where, where, where if you've got too many people in, in areas where the water is scarce. Um, but if you look at heat waves, for example, and some of the others, you see a much, much bigger in, impact at, eight, at four degrees than you do at, at two degrees, with one billion people affected at two degrees and eight billion at four degrees. And that just illustrates that the impact of climate change is not linear. Um, the, the, the atmosphere itself is not linear, so you get because you get these feedbacks, they can amplify things. But um, there are thresholds that you can reach where actually the impact on people or the impact on the um, ecosystems just multiplies because that system is, is very fragile and uh, be, perhaps because of other things that are happening. So I think there's some good examples here of some of those, those sorts of risks. Um, for example, if you look at food security for the UK, it says 70% of agricultural land is classed as poor. So, you know, we will have to change the way we use our agriculture. Of course, we'll be able to grow some things that we can't grow now, but um, it will have to be different. So um, what does it mean for wildlife? So what changes are we seeing? So this, um, this diagram is quite interesting. It's a bit difficult to interpret. So I will, well, just, there's just a lot here, which I, I will explain it. So this is from the um, Millennium Ecosystem Assessment in 2005, but it's quite a useful illustration. So if you look at the colours, that's those are the changes that are the result of past evolution. So if you look at habitat change, for example, then um, the um, that in all these different part different types of habitat, boreal forest going down to inland water, coastal island, mountain, and so on. There's a lot of oranges and reds, which is basically saying that habitat change has, has had a big impact on those those regions. That's the kind of thing you'd expect because we you know we know that the um, impact of human populations has been enormous in all different parts of the world. Whereas if we look at climate change, the impacts so far are relatively small, apart from in the, in the polar regions where the warming is much bigger in the, near the poles um, than at the equator, there's an amplifying effect there. Whereas if we look at what will happen in the future, um, that's the arrows. So basically, if, there's a, if the arrow is pointing upwards, that means there's a very rapid increase of impact. So this is saying that in the future, we would expect climate change to have a big impact. So if you think about that, we're in an area where you've already got a, you know, a, an ecosystem that's very under threat because of habitat change or invasive species or whatever it is. Adding climate change on top of that is going to have a really big impact. If it was a resilient system and it, hadn't, it was intact, it might not have such a big impact. So one of the things here is that it's the multiple drivers that are important. The fact that there's lots of things happening at once, uh, and it, uh, air pollution is an, an example here, and, and um, uh, land pollution as well. Um, the pollution is having a big impact and uh, already having an impact in a lot of areas, but is going to have a significant impact in, in most areas in the future. So it's, it's the fact that you've got multiple drivers, I think, that really makes a big difference that... Um, you know, one extra thing on top of everything else can make a big difference. And that's really what we're talking about here. And that's one of the reasons, as Simon mentioned, I'm um, editing this new climate journal is, is really it's about how you bring together the different factors that are important for a particular system and, uh, you know, make sure that you understand those. And if you know, there's something you add on to that, some kind of stress that you add to that, does that have, have create a tipping point for that, that system? And this just I think this illustrates that really well. So um, this is an example of the um, observed changes in northward dispersal of species. And um, don't worry about the three bars, they're just different ways of measuring things. But you can see a whole range of species here and they've all moved northwards. This is in the Northern Hemisphere and with just a few moving southwards. And, and this, these are, again, you can then do modeling to understand whether you, what you'd expect to happen because of changes in climate and whether that 
is consistent with the changes that you see. So that's that, it's a good illustration of the, the kind of um, change that we might expect. This um, is it's actually in Wales because I got this a couple, some of these slides from a colleague at Natural Resources Wales. But it's um, this is a, a mountain in Wales, and it's what the, this series of pictures will show is the spread of bracken up the hillside as the temperature warms. So you should be able to see it looking a bit more green now, and then more green again right at the top. Um, and that's just an illustration of how the landscape might look different in the future. Um, and we're also seeing changes in distributions of competitiveness with climate change. So it's not just as simple of oh, the temperature's gone up, therefore all the species are going to move northwards. It's also that, you know, um, things come out of hibernation and their food's not there because one, one species um, you know, is more responsive to changes in temperature than another species. And so that can create ten, um, stresses for different species. So. Um, the little egret and the Dartford warbler, are, um, which we're lucky enough to have in Devon, I know I've seen them, they are spreading northwards, so that's a good thing, they're winners, I guess. Um, the um, flowering of ivy and the New Zealand willow herb, uh, which New Zealand willow herb is an invasive alien, are spreading in the west and north mountains of the UK. So these are examples of things that you know really are more of a problem. Um, this is an example of a winner. So the common wall lizard, the, the left top left hand side shows the current distribute the observed distribution, and then the um, we've got the change in the 2020s, the 2050s, and the 2080s, and this is with a high emission scenario. So this is if we increase greenhouse gases at the same rate that we are currently. And what you can see here, as you as you go further into the future, this lizard is spreading further north because it's getting warmer and drier, and yeah, its its habitat is. It's, it's, it's helpful to it, so it's spreading. Basically, the, um, the blue areas are gains and the red areas are losses. So um, it's moving out of regions that maybe are becoming in, inhospitable, so more inhospitable to it. So in terms of the UK, the um, common scoter is a loser. Um, it's, um, I don't have the current distribution, unfortunately, um, but you can see in the 2020s, there's already some loss with this brown area here. And then the 2050s more, and in the 2080s more. Um, and uh, so obviously that's you know um, not good. Um, so what can we do about it? Well, obviously um, there's a lot of talk about um, decreasing greenhouse gases. Um, we recently had an air source heat pump fitted. Hopefully that will help us to do our bit. Um, there's all there's things all of us can do. But we also need to recognise that the climate is already changing. Even if we reduce greenhouse gases dramatic, dramatically, we're still committed to a certain amount of global warming because um, carbon dioxide in particular stays in the atmosphere for a long time. It has a half life of 100 years, which means that the stuff that we put there now will be there a long time, will continue to warm the atmosphere. So we do need to do things to be able to adapt to that changing climate. Um, that we're going to see. So it's it, it, what's one of the reasons it'll be very hard to avoid two degrees because we're, we're already we're, we've already a long way to being committed to that. So this is an example of um, a kind of new threat that's emerged because um, uh, you know, partially because of climate change. And this is the oak processionary moth. So one of the things that Defra wanted to do was to you know to protect the country from it. It's a, non, it's a non native pest already at high risk to the UK. It causes widespread destruction of native oak in the UK and severe rash on animals and, and presumably on people as well. And there was an outbreak in July 2019. So the um, UK Plant Health Service intercepted 60 infected oak from Europe and the, um, some of the other DEFRA partners acted to eradicate it. One of the things that they used was modelling done by the Met Office where they looked at um, the, the weather conditions of when the caterpillars were likely to emerge into moths, enabling them to spread rapidly. So they were able to target their um, eradication um, methods to, um, you know, so that they could avoid that happening, basically. So it's it's a good example of how you can use different parts of science to help you to um, to deal with these sorts of problems. But it's really, obviously, it's you know, it's it, it's. It's a way of, um, it's not, it doesn't fix the problem. It, uh, you know, it deals with the problem um, as, it, as it arises um, on, on a day-to-day -day basis. 
So um, other examples, um, obviously, there's different ways that we can use the landscape. There's a lot of talk at the moment about how much carbon can be sequestered into soils and also how the way we farm can affect the amount of um, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Um, you know, people are talking about if you have too many animals, for example, that can cause more methane. Um, I think that the way that we the people farm is it's really uncertain as to the impacts it can have. And that's there's a lot of scope, I think, for changing farming methods to improve things. Obviously, organic farming is one of those. Um, it has its own issues, of course, because it uses quite a lot of land, but um, you know, there are huge benefits potentially. Um, this example here, I don't know the full, I wasn't given the full description of this, but this is an example of how um, landscape might change in the future. And um, so this is a hillside. Uh, interestingly, in the um, composite future picture, the sun's shining more. That's not actually an impact of climate change, but um, it's a sunny day. And what you can see if you go back is that the, um, there's a pond appeared there. So, you know, that's, that's um, a good way of uh, improving um, biodiversity, but also, um, you know, th these sorts of changes will help to sequester carbon. Um, presumably the crops growing here are uh, more suited to the warmer climate. There may well be some biofuels crops here as well. Um, and then there's a wind uh, turbine and the um, I'm not sure whether this landscape has changed or not because the sun is shining on it and it wasn't before. So um, so my final slide is um, just to show you the scale of the problem again. So here we've got the um, annual CO2 emissions uh, going back to 1751, right the way up to 1990 in the yellow and then <clears throat> 2019. Um, this was produced in the middle of 2019, which is where it says projected there. But you can see we've been talking about climate change in international um, agreements since 1990. There was the Rio summit in 1990, and they said we must do something about climate change. Since then, um, the CO2 has increased more than it had since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. I think that's quite a sobering thought, actually. Um, for all the things that we've done, for example, in the UK, we've reduced our emissions, but we import more goods with embedded emissions in them. Um, you know, it's it, the uh, CO2 is increasing still very rapidly. So I will um, finish with that and invite questions. Oh, I was just going to give a plug to my um, journal. There you go. There's the picture of the cover. I can't I'm hear anything. Okay. I apologise. Can you hear me now? I can. Yes. 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 Good. Yes, Vicky. Thank you so much. That was that was absolutely fascinating. Um, I, I, I must admit I hadn't really quite realised the the interaction between um, the, uh, the 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 effects of water vapour and re like reflection and <laughs> and how things are getting out of hand no matter what we do. Um, one of the questions I quite like to ask you, just ahead of everybody else, is: is Do you think you can really um, win the hearts and minds of the populace to a, a, a great enough extent to get them to actually do anything that's worthwhile? Well, I think I think we have to we have to make it easy for people. So um, it's you know. It, it's, it's going to have to be for people's benefit. I mean, a lot of a lot of the change, a lot of changes happening in big business because people are starting to put pressure on big business to do things differently. Um, so it's but it, but if it's too hard and it does fit, you know, it feels like something that's very difficult to do. But there are things that can be done that are easier, and there are incentives that governments can put in place. There are incentives that we can make for each other that help with with some of these sorts of things. Um, but equally, I think we need to understand the unintended consequences so it's sometimes um you know the government for example encouraged people to buy diesel cars because it would de decrease the amount of co2 that we were emitting because of the climate target but they underestimated the impact that that would have on air quality because the well because i think the the car manufacturers said that they could clean up you know, their diesel cars and they didn't do that sufficiently but it illustrates how by focusing on one problem without looking at the impact it could have on other problems. And, and that's why it's really important to look at these problems in the round. 
And I think, you know, uh, they, so it's, you know, it, there, there aren't, there aren't simple, there isn't one simple solution. There are lots of things that we need to do and there are lots of things that we need to try. And many of the things that make the biggest difference are actually things that are outside an individual's control. But nevertheless, public opinion make, can make a huge difference. And that, you know, of course, there are some things that we can do um, ourselves. But for example, if you buy a, I mean, we, as I say, we just got a, a, an SOC pump. If you buy an electric car, you're relying on the fact that the government's going to change the way it produces electricity. If it doesn't do that, then actually there's no point in doing those things. So. Mm. And, and do you think that the, the, the drive towards electrification of transport uh, is, is in step with that, that infrastructural change? Or, or, or is it just um, a, a, a bit of a fad which can't be realised? But I, I hear all sorts of um, people, this chap I've talked to from Western Power, who's saying that if everybody had bought an electric car, as things stand at the moment, they put their car into yeah. a charge overnight, and they'd stop everything else happening. So we well, don't need it, that real infrastructure to make it all work. Yeah, I'm not, I, th I think um, on the, the time scale that electric cars have been introduced, that's possibly not the biggest problem, actually. The, one of the big problems with um, electric vehicles and stuff is, the, is the, some of the, um, the materials that they use to make the batteries, particularly. Um, and also, you know, so um, they use quite a lot of rare metals. So there's a lot of work going into understanding how to reduce that. Um, and lots of those rare metals are produced in really um, very difficult conditions where people are hugely exploited um, and there's a huge amount of pollution and, and there just isn't enough of them. So things that there, there's, there's quite a lot of technical challenges. Um, the, um, yeah, producing the electricity, uh, I, I, I think it's, it's an infrastructure problem and the governments, you know, the, the trouble is the, the scale of investment that you need is very large and governments need to set, send the right signals and put the right sorts of investment in place. So it's, it's, it's not easy to do, but um, there are a lot of people out there far more expert than me in those things who, who, you know, who can help to make those things happen. I've got uh, a number of questions that have come through mm -hmm. here, Vicky. Uh, the first one from Catherine Bennett. Um, is your journal open access uh, so the general public? Yes. yes, it is. Uh, so I should have said that, actually. Yes, it's completely online. It's open access. Uh, there aren't any papers published yet. It's very new. <laughs> so at the moment, I'm encouraging people to submit papers. So, um, um, But uh, it, it is open access, and that's really the direction of travel that a lot of um, journals are going in now. Um, so th because this is a new journal, we felt it was important to make it open access right from the beginning. And also not, you know, not to have a paper copy. So although I think I showed you a picture of the front cover, um, it's it has a front cover, but what's the front cover? Because it doesn't exist in, you know, it doesn't exist on paper. Um, and the, interestingly, the um, the research fund, the, the research funders in the UK are now. Um, with their research grants, they provide funding for open access because you basically somebody has to pay for the journal. You have to pay to publish as opposed to pay to read it. That's that's how open access works. But other countries, interestingly, uh, in, and bizarrely, my, uh, my the other co-editor in chief is from Australia. And in Australia, the funders are not funding open access. So, in fact, it's very hard for Australian scientists to publish in an open access journal unless they're collaborating with a, a scientist from another part of the world where they do have provision for that so I think it will you know it will happen it's taking longer than it should but I'm hoping that journals like this will help it to happen more quickly and yes um, one of the other things we'd like to do is um, do some uh, kind of I suppose more user-friendly um, versions of the papers maybe ask people to write short summaries that will make it easier for members of the public to read because there's a lot of jargon in scientific papers as I expect you know um, yeah <laughs> um... Do you see a role for carbon capture as well as efforts to reduce emissions, or is that just greenwash? Um, that's a very good question. I don't know the answer to that. Um, I think we have to investigate every, poss every possibility. I mean, the difficulty with something like carbon capture is, of course, you've got to use a lot of energy to do it. Um, and 
that you know but uh, and, and i think the, the but, but the big issue is that it hasn't really been done at scale yet i think there are some pilot projects around um it's it is used um it's used for example to extract more oil um and get because you pump stuff back under the ground and so so the technology exists but it hasn't been done at the scale that's needed uh, and of course if it does leak slowly um then that would be an issue i I, I'm told that that's not that much of an issue um, because these, you know, the, the, the kind of areas where, and we think, you know, that there are places, for example, where oil and gas has been underground for millennia and it hasn't leaked. So it's, it's those sorts of places is where you'd put it. Yeah. Um, but but I'm, not, I'm not an expert. Maybe there may be somebody in the audience who knows more than I do. But uh. Okay. Um, Suzanne says, fascinating, shocking. Thanks for such an informative talk. Can you spell out what we can do as individuals and, and, and communities? That's, uh, could keep, keep you going for a while. Uh. Well, I think, I mean, the biggest um, use of, of uh, CO2 is, is actually in the home. So actually, um, I mean, this is why, one of the reasons we changed to an air source heat pump. I mean, we're using, I think, a, a third of the energy we were before, and our house is warmer right. in kilowatt hours, but our, our heating bill is more expensive because electricity is four times the price, our electricity is four times the price of gas. Mm. So there's something wrong there, and the incentives are wrong there, um, because that and that, that so it, it, I think it, that's an illustration of something that you can do as an individual. It's expensive, so it's not, you know, that um, we, that there are, there are some, well, there were subsidies. I think, I'm not sure whether they still, they're still there, but um, that's an example of where you can do something, but you need the government to do something as well, because actually what we're, what we're banking on is in five years time, electricity will be much cheaper than gas, because otherwise it doesn't make any sense. Um, but um, so there are things that you can do. Um, you can look at, you know, obviously traveling less. You, um, you can look at um, where the food comes from that you eat. Um, I think the, um, that it's, but it, it, need, it needs to happen at different scales, I think. Uh, I'm sure, as I say, lots of people in the audience will have lots of ideas of things that maybe they're already doing or other things that they can do. That they might want to share. Okay, that's great. Um, how can we, uh, Andrew Smirden says, how can we change the behaviour of countries such as Brazil who are intent on continuing deforestation? Well, I, th I mean, I think uh, Brazil's an interesting example, isn't it? Because it's, I mean, you just look at what's happening with their COVID problems as well, it, that they're, politically, I think it's difficult there. Um, I mean, we do need to be a bit careful. You know, we've we've already chopped down all our forest. Okay, there's a bit behind me here, but um, it's um, whereas you know, and, and countries like Brazil will argue, well, we want to exploit our land as well. But actually, the prob the other problem for them is it makes no sense really. In a lot of places where they chop, the, you know, they chop the forest down and they plant. Uh, or they you know they have ag agriculture there actually it's not very good soil and and actually it doesn't it's not a sustainable what they're creating is not sustainable so um it's not really in their short their medium term interests either um and it's really how you create a system which which um will will correct that i suppose um but one of the things that people are looking at have looked at to um you know, reduce the impact of climate change is is planting more trees. But of course, if you plant more trees, that will sequester more carbon. But um, you know, it, it, it takes a long time. And what happens when somebody chops a tree down? Um, I think biofuels. I mentioned biofuels earlier, but one of the problems with biofuels is that they take up a lot of land. Yeah. They're very bulky, and they they either displace food or they displace natural ecosystems. And to, to grow them on the scale that the IPCC suggests you could do to, to um, uh, basically use biofuels and then capture the carbon when it's, when it's released and store it. So you basically have what they call biofuel car ca um, carbon capture and storage. That you know, if you just do the sums, the amount of land that you need and the devastation that you would cause to wildlife, just it, it, that, it, it just wouldn't work in any case, because if you, in order to do that, um, you'd actually release a lot of carbon by changing the land use in the short term. It would take you, in some cases, 50 years to get back to where you started. So you may not, you know, you may not actually even see a benefit in the long run. So the, the, this is an illustration of how 
something that can appear to be a, sol a solution sometimes isn't. So it's you know it's it's important that we understand those things. I think. Um, but sometimes it's more than one thing that needs to happen at once. And some of those things we can do as individuals and some of them we rely on other people to do. Yeah, governments to change things. Mm. Um, Sheila Stringer says, is it a good thing to purchase solar panels for your home? Um, that is good. I don't know. I mean, I think so. Um, I, I think the, I mean, um, one of the, there's the... Um, Ones that directly heat your water, those are the best ones because they're but effectively you're using the solar gain directly on the on the on the water um, rather than turning it into electricity and feeding it back into the grid. But of course, the, the certainly the incentive there was a a subsydy a few years ago um, where my brother fitted solar panels in Buxton and where you know they don't get much sunshine, but he he's still making money out of it because the government pays him to to deliver stuff to the to the um, to the network. Um, but um, uh, and again, you've got to look at the balance of what you know uh, that, that it's it's obviously um, producing electricity cleanly, but the um, the materials that, that you use to create the solar panels, I think they have in, improved massively. And one of the benefits of providing incentives for people to buy more of these sorts of technologies is that as you get to a larger scale, the um, innovation that you get at scale, you know, because companies will be buying for your business um, you know as they, things will get cheaper and also cleaner so I think with all of these technologies they're relatively new you know what well, solar panels aren't but you know a lot of these things the more that they can scale up the more that, that these things become viable and actually they can become you know um, more useful yeah 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 and obviously your roof space your, the, the top of your roof is a space that isn't being used for anything else so why not no. yeah um Please, could you share your talk so we can look at the graphs, et cetera, in detail? Um, so interesting and great for evidencing. Well, I think the answer to that is you will be, will be doing that talk because it's uh, yeah. available on uh, YouTube. Yeah, and if, if you want a PDF of my talk that you can share with people, that's I, I can do that. I mean, you know, the slides, if people want to see the slides rather than listen to me speaking again, then I can do that as well. That would be helpful. Uh, from Eric, uh, recars isn't the issue that big business uh, is looking to benefit. Cars are relatively new. More people could cycle, especially with electric bikes. Um, yeah, so uh, it is part part of the answer to uh, abandon cars and find other other ways of getting around. I think. I think that's a really good good point. I think in and in cities it is changing. If you talk to younger people living in cities many of them don't have a car because you know actually it's just you know where do you park it you can't get anywhere so I think it's changing perhaps more quickly in cities I think you know electric vehicles are more popular in cities as well partly for pollution reasons partly because there are more places you can charge it so I think the um sometimes the the drivers in you know the the the, the things that encourage us to do things are different depending on what your circumstances are um, but I've certainly seen a lot of electric bicycles during lockdown. I'm sure we all have. Yeah, so, so have I. I've been cycling with them on a number of occasions, mm. trying to keep up. Oh, that, that's that's very energetic of you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but actually, they, it do, does increase the scope and your ability to use mm. um, bicycles, and especially in hilly areas. So, um, yeah, I think electric bikes are a part of the answer, possibly. Um, how will climate change affect habitats on Dartmoor? That's from Dawn Williamson. Well, I, I don't know the answer to that, but is there, there may be somebody in the, in the audience who, I mean, I've given you some examples. I mean, the sorts of things that you'll see are, you know, these, um, well, essentially the kind, of the kind of average prediction for the UK is that we'll have warmer, wetter winters and hotter, drier summers. But when it rains in the summer, you're going to get heavier storms. So if you imagine what that would do on Dartmoor, then that you know, that, that, that will lead to, 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 to certain changes. But I don't know the details. I'm sure there have been modelling studies done on Dartmoor, but I don't, I don't know the details. There may be somebody here who does. But, um, if anybody has, then there's, let us know. Well, somebody's just put, we'll obviously lose species on Dartmoor, but we'll also gain southern species so that there are many factors factors affecting climate change yep. but affecting wildlife but climate change must be used as an excuse for trashing species that's that's absolutely true yep. i think 
I think there's, there's the two parts, aren't there, is that, that we shouldn't give up trying to protect species, but we also have to recognise that there may be impacts that actually make it that it's not viable for that species to continue in the same way, in the same place. Mm -hmm. um, and this is where kind of l landscape corridors are important, you know, where species can, can get from one place to another. Because yeah. if you just have a little enclave somewhere, it, it put, it's more at risk. Yeah, yeah. Um, to what extent does particulate pollution accelerate uh, the ice melt? Um, so this is referring to, um, so I mentioned about particulates affecting the um, cooling of the atmosphere overall. It, it has quite complex effects, but it, it tends to uh, mean that basically cloud particles um, clouds can nucleate around the, the, these particles. So you've got you know, dust particles and so on, and the, um, the water vapour condenses around them, so you get more cloud, and that's why it tends to cool the climate at the surface. Um, but what it does, um, some of the uh, particles, if they reach, for example, you know, the, um, northern icy latitudes, they can darken the surface, and that can lead to um, more melting of the ice. So if it's black, if it's soot, black soot, for example, and there are indications that that is happening, but I, I mean, I'm not sure on the latest studies, but that's certainly that is certainly a factor. Yeah, there, there was a, uh, an article on the television of the Athabasca glacier in um, the Rockies and yeah. uh, how particulate pollution was it increasing the effect of this, the ice melt. Well, I think they, I think they've seen it in the Himalayas as well, but I'm not sure. Um, okay, uh, nature recovery networks, yay. Yeah, well, I think I think that is illustrates the point I was trying to make earlier. Actually, doesn't it that you know we need we need much more of a network of in the natural environment. Yeah. To build resilience. Yes, absolutely. Um, Will the dry weather and heavy rains cause more soil erosion? I would imagine so, but I'm not an expert on soils. So um, I think it's, you know, you do tend to get, I mean, way, if, you've, if it's been very dry, you know, and you then get flooding, you, you, you then, get, and then get heavy rain, you do tend to get more flooding, you can get more um, stuff running off. Equally, if it's been very wet and it's very, the ground is very sodden, you will get more flooding as well. So if, you know, if the ground's partially wet, it can absorb more. Um, so all of those things have an impact on flooding and clearly they will have an impact on soil erosion as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, what are your views on geoengineering proposals to reduce global warming? So um, for those of you who don't know about what geoengineering is, the idea here is that you... Um, so, I mean, in a sense, carbon capture and storage is a, is a form of geoengineering. It's taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, but it's actually, it has the benefit that it's actually removing the thing that's causing the problem. A lot of geoengineering ideas are, well, the climate is warming, so let's do something to cool it down. So, for example, they've talked about putting mirrors in space. They've talked about having basically an art artificial volcanic eruption, putting aerosol I told you that aerosol is a problem if you have it in the lower atmosphere because it causes air pollution. Um, but if you put that aerosol into the stratosphere, it um, gives you a cooling of the climate. And um, in fact, um, we can see, if we look at the temperature records, um, 1992, when there was a big volcanic eruption in Mount Pinatubo in the tropics, that it gets a huge amount of um, particles ended up in the stratosphere. And that cooled the climate by about half a degree, I think for about two years. Um, on average. Um, and so that the idea is you shovel this aerosol up there and that cools the climate. So there are, there are a number of problems with that. One is you have to keep doing it. And, you know, to get the, the energy of a, a volcanic eruption, that's a lot of, you know, a lot of energy. And the other thing is that it doesn't just cool the climate on average. It also, it changes the climate. It changes the, um, um, you yeah, know, the distribution of the, 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 the general circulation. It will change the storm. So some places will gain and others will lose. And if you know, a country decided to do that and that affects the world climate, surely other countries who are badly impacted by that would could sue them. So it, I don't see how it, 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 has govern, it has huge governance issues and scientifically it's difficult, I think. Um, that's not to say, I mean, because people keep bringing it up, we need to do proper scientific studies of it, but that's not saying that we should consider doing it. Um, that, that, you know, and I think sometimes people, 
um, confuse those two things. It has made people reluctant to study these problems because they think that, you know, if I study this, people will think that I think it's a good idea. Well, actually, it doesn't, you know, it's just that we need to understand it because we need to, um, it you know, may turn out that something is a good idea, but probably not. Um, Start geoengineering wars. <laughs> well, you could. You can imagine that, can't you? So yeah. um, people have talked about climate wars, but um, but we're we're not actually doing this deliberately. It's just that you know we like the things that um, that, that that cause the problem, and I find it difficult to stop doing them. But um, okay, um, Robin Aronson uh, says, uh, are there other examples of negative? in other words, helpful feedback? Um, there are, and I think, um, well, the, the one helpful feedback obviously is the absorption of carbon dioxide into the ocean. Yeah. So um, that, that is a feedback that is slowing the climate change at the moment. So that's a good feedback. It's just that as we go into the future and it gets warmer, that will become less of a good feedback. So that is, that is a, a negative feedback. Um, there are other examples, and I can't think of them off the top of my head at the moment, but um, uh, they'll probably come to me. Okay. Um, and Simon has just asked a question that I was wondering about as well. Uh, what are your expectations of COP25? Uh, what do you think? Um, what's the best that we can hope for from that? Well, hopefully, uh, a strengthening of the Paris Agreement and, you know, uh, stronger targets that people will agree to. Um, that's, you know, that's what people are aiming for. Um, the, the whole climate, I mean, I've been to a lot of climate conferences and they, it's a very slow, laborious, in, incremental process. It absorbs a lot of, you know, people's energies and uh, carbon and, you know, air miles and carb, carbon stuff as well um, but it's a, a, it's it's a diplomatic process so I think the I mean it's interesting because Paris was a huge diplomatic triumph for France I mean I think they, they, they achieved a huge amount in terms of getting an agreement but in terms of actually making a difference to the climate it's not clear how much difference it's made and that it's that they're slight, sometimes slightly disconnected but you do need all of these different elements to come together um, and I think that, I mean, the, the whole um, environment, social governance agenda has become more important. So for big business, for example, they're now being asked to report on ESG. And so, certainly it's something that um, the, you know, the chief executive of the Bank of England, whose name has gone out of my head just at the moment, the, the previous one, he put a lot of these things in place in the UK um, to encourage business to do more. And I think that that is, that there is a lot of, so there's certainly a lot of lip service being paid to what they call ESG. Hopefully it will translate into something useful. Um, I, I, you know, talking to people in, in kind of finance, what they, what they want are metrics where they can measure how good a company is at dealing, you know, being green, if you like. And the problem with metrics is that they can oversimplify the problem. So, and it's that what they may end up doing is that companies will, some companies at least will change in order to fit the metric rather than changing in order to be the best they possibly can be. Yeah. And so I think that type of thing needs to be looked at as well. But I, I mean, I'm just trying to illustrate that it's not just about what governments do, which is what COP is about. It is also about what, you know, other parts of society do as well. Um, but uh, I, it's, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, the government hasn't given terribly strong signals up to now about what they're, um, their own uh, pathway in, in this um, towards towards the, the um, conference um, but hopefully they will do I mean it's you know it's a difficult time at the moment I know for everybody yeah uh, uh, interestingly enough a major corporations represented at COP25 are they are, are they going to be represented at COP25 so, so the way it works is like the, Google and Apple. the um there's a lot, there's a lot goes on around the, so there's a kind of lots of meetings going on at the same time, effectively. So you've got the conference, the parties, which is basically the governments. And then you have a lot of side events and a lot of side activities, which involve big business, um, NGOs, all sorts of different people. 
And a lot of that will happen online this year, I think, which is a good thing. Um, but, um, you know, I mean, I've been I've attended things where, you know, finance conferences where people are talking about these some of these esoteric finance measures. It seems quite a long way removed from climate change, but it is actually about climate change. Um, so they they're not represented directly, but they but effectively they are. And they, of course, they are talking to the governments as well because they want you know, they want the right incentives to be in place to support their business as well. Interesting. Um, any moves to retrofit solutions to damaging air condition systems that are widespread in cities, i.e. inefficient causing atmospheric heating uh, whilst cooling buildings? So, yeah. Uh, so um, just not, so, uh, not specifically on air conditioning, but in general, the general energy use and in cities means that they tend to be warmer than the surrounding countryside. So it's what we call the urban heat effect, which yeah. is what you're kind of talking about here. Um, so, you know, anything that uses, you know, uses energy, basically, you know, it, it end, tends to end up as heat. Um, um, and uh, that does have an impact. Um, and so it can make, you know, places like London on, during a heat wave particularly unpleasant. Um, and uh, there, there's a lot of, there are a lot of standards in place to try and make buildings more efficient and to use, you know, uh, use less power, um, because you know that's where a lot of um, a lot of energy gets used in buildings. So, you know, I think there is quite a lot going on in that space. But, um, the, I mean, Grenfell is an interesting example because it, you know, they were supposedly refurbishing Grenfell Tower to put in better insulation. Mm -hmm. But the standards that they were using and the, the checking that was done and the way that they put the materials together and that, well, it was particularly that the manufacturers, you know, cut, cut um, you know, they sold this thing. Oh, it's really environmentally friendly, but it turned it, but it wasn't fire. It wasn't fire safe. So uh, um, it's, you know, it, it, the, the particular, you know, angle that they got to be more green allows people to, to to market something that it's green with and then people forget to ask whether it actually does the other thing that they, it really needs to be able to do so i think there is quite a lot of work to be done in that kind of space but but i think buildings are particularly an issue actually in terms in the way that we heat and cool them yeah. and that there's a huge amount that could be done there to to create to, to reduce um the amount of uh, greenhouse gases that are produced yeah um, one of the challenges we've got pretty old building stock, really. And um, a lot of um, densely populated urban areas. So it yeah. limits your ability to uh, to improve things. Well, I think I think the dense dense populations can, you know, can, if you get it right, can help you, of course, because you're not using up as much space. Yeah. Um, okay. Most people are focused on immediate personal problems and climate change is not a priority. Do you have ideas about how we can inject some urgency into change? Um, Rather than kicking the can down the road, I guess. Yeah, I think we need to make it easy and we need to make it the norm. I mean, you know, everybody re everybody puts their stuff dutifully in the recycling bins now, don't they? Which they, you know, didn't do 20 years ago. And it's, but, you know, if, it, if it's, more much more expensive to be green or if it's much more difficult to be green you won't do it because you, because you've got other things that you have to do first so um i think we do you know we do have to make it it, it doesn't we do need things that make it easier yeah so yeah make it easy um and i think i think that's it actually vicky i think we've you know, gone through all the questions thanks very much for answering those so comprehensively that's all right. Simon, over to you. Well, thank you very much. And thank you very much, Vicky. Very, very stimulating talk. Very interesting. Um, I'm sure we've learned a lot, but also it's obviously something that people think a lot about and have a lot of questions to ask. Um, and uh, I think you've, uh, you've covered the ground very, very, very completely there. Um, so thank you so much. Um, we will indeed um, uh, be putting your talk up on, on YouTube, but um, if you could let us have a, a PDF of your slides and, uh, yeah. and we can try and make them available to our, our, our members, they, I'm sure we'll be more than grateful for that. Um, and let's hope that we can uh, drive things forward, if not for us, for our, for our, uh, our, our subsequent mm. generations and, and grandchildren.
Um, I'd like just to remind everybody, next talk will be on um, uh, the third um, Tuesday in May. And again, it's about Dartmoor Hill farming and the new environmental legislation. Um, and it will be interesting to hear what Naomi Oakley and Mark Owen have to say about changes in weather and climate as, as it relates to hill farming. As I think they certainly uh, um, have uh, a, 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 a unique approach to hill farming, which is not um, a re reflection on the more intensive farming we see more in the lowlands, and it makes a huge difference to the way they live. Um, I think uh, they probably would say the best way to deal with being cold in the house is to put more clothes on, uh, which is something people tend not to do. So, anyway, thank you so much again, Vicky, um, and uh, thank you very much, everybody, for uh, turning up and. Uh, uh, as I say, we'll try and make sure that our messages get through to you a little bit more efficiently. Um, but uh, please bear with us in the meantime. So uh, with that, I'll bring the, uh, the proceedings to an end. And thank you very much indeed. Thanks, Vicky. Bye-bye now. Thanks, Vicky. Thank you.